I'm Fred Rainbow. I work with uh, AFSI International. I used to work with the United States Naval Institute. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Admiral Herb Brown, who will introduce this panel. This panel is going to talk about what the warfighters need. And the uh, moderator you have is a true warfighter uh, who has this great intellect at the same time. Don't be uh, ever fooled by the cowboy routine that he uses. Uh, but by far and away, uh, one of the most challenging minds and one of the best people I've ever had the opportunity to work with, Herb Brown. Thank you very much, Fred. I Ten minutes ago, I was given a, uh, a homework assignment. It's, it's always so nice to be surrounded by your bosses and your friends. The, uh, I was given a homework assignment just as I came in, and, and part of the continuing edu education program for AFCA at West, if, uh, if you are enrolled in this, uh, this Comp TIA Continuing Education Unit, you can get credit for listening to this session. You have to stay for the entire time. And then all you got to do, you can get Frank right over here on your way out. I guess you just show your card and you'll get, you'll get credit for, uh, for receiving some education. Information at C, what do our warfighters need? Uh, actually, that should be thought of as the subject for every panel at every West convention. I mean, the focus is, is what do the warfighter need? I would like to do this. I'd like for you to do me a favor and try to help me distinguish between requirements and needs. Uh, this is not a requirements group. These are a needs group. Requirements are those things that Washington does. There's a great program that satisfies requirements. They're enormous programs. So this is not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about needs. We've had some stage setters during West. Uh, first and foremost, I think, has been virtually every speaker has talked about we're returning to our, our maritime culture. We're, we, our Marines are going uh, back afloat. That is, in fact, our future. And hopefully, maybe some of the needs will come from, from that thought. Emma Gortney, uh, made it clear that it's recognized that DOD is going to continue to lag, always has, and will continue to lag uh, Silicon Valley. But I would, rec I would suggest that our sailors and Marines aren't lagging, but DOD certainly is. And Admiral Blake, following up to that, he says, you know, that the, that the rapid acquisition process remains in place. And that's encouraging. And then he said, but. And this is an enormous but. He said that COTS, as wonderful as COTS is and the, for the wonderful things that COTS does for us, it, there's some baggage with COTS, that uh, the integration cost is often enormous, that it's missing a couple of other legs, the training leg and the logistics leg. So as, as exciting as COTS is, as these gentlemen talk about needs, uh, it is, uh, there are some, some issues with COTS. I know that when, when I was working for Randall Clemens and we were doing fleet battle experiments, one of the, one of the frustrations was that we would identify a technology that, was, that we just really needed to have on our ships today. And, and uh, then, then when that commander left, the next guy would come aboard and say, Who ordered, why, would, why do we have this? So there are some real issues with COTS and we need to, we need to at least admit that. But the real issue is, is FCA and the Naval Institute, as always, did exactly the right job in bringing together exactly the right paddle members to talk about needs. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a Brigadier General Sturdivant, who is the Assistant uh, Wing Commander for the 3rd Marine Air Wing, and was the former uh, Commanding Officer of the 26th MU, to talk about needs from the Marines' perspective and, and hopefully as it relates to needs aboard ship. Uh, and then Admiral Gumutato is going, to, who's the commander of uh, Carrier Stripe Group 11, will talk about it as he, they, as he talks about it as a sailor, a surface warrior. Actually, if I had my way, these two gentlemen would say, as they were walking out of their headquarters, they walked through their command center and they looked at the, at the gunny sergeant and the chief and said, hey, if I could bring you back something today to help us 
with information at sea, what would it be? And I hope that that's what they talk about. Okay, then we're going to round up with, uh, around with uh, Admiral Jerry Burroughs, the PEO C4I, because as, as exciting as it is to identify the needs that we require from both the, the Marine perspective and the Navy perspective for this maritime naval battle that we face in the future, we need to add some technical reality to it and some financial reality to it, and hopefully uh, we'll ask Admiral Jerry Burroughs to do that. So with that, General, you've got it. All right, thank you very much, Admiral. Good afternoon, everyone. The, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you were in the audience yesterday when we talked about Navy and Marine Corps hang together or hang separately, okay? And I came in because I wanted to hear that. I wasn't surprised by the answer that I heard. I mean, you know, it was pretty, pretty easy to figure out what was going to happen. I did leave, uh, and I didn't have an opportunity to hear Admiral Mullen speak, but someone gave me a, a brief recap on that. And I will tell you, um, when you think about what the Admiral had to say, and he, he talked about, it, if I got it correctly, how important the Army is, how our, our nation and our defense is kind of defined by the Army. Okay, and I, I think that's true over the course of the last 10 years. But when we come out of, you know, we're out of OIF, out of, out of Iraq, as we come out of Afghanistan, the most relevant force that we're going to have on the field is going to be the Navy and Marine Corps team. All right, I, have, I am thoroughly convinced of that. And I will talk about budget and requirements for a minute if you'd allow me to do that, Admiral. The, um, I just love programs and resources. I was the deputy for Lieutenant General Whistler, and he was opposite uh, Admiral Blake. Okay, and over the course of last year, you know, I've been in the building in the Pentagon a couple of times, and we used to beat our heads against the wall because we spent, we, the Marine Corps, spent so much time fighting the Navy, all right, over the budget battles. And I will tell you, there was so much to be gained if we would work together, there's a lot to be gained for that Navy and Marine Corps team by working together because I will tell you, our role is going to become more important than it is today. And you know, when we shift our focus on the Pacific, who are you going to turn to? It's the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps. Okay, my, my comments are going to be based on my amphibious uh, L-class ship background, okay? Not the, the carrier piece is going to come from the Admiral. All right, I'm going to talk about amphibious operations. Um, and I'm going to talk about, and I'll, I'll tell you, and I, I think um, General Spees touched on it yesterday in the morning panel on the hang together, hang separately piece. The... There's been a lot of discussion in D.C., and I, I tell you what, I was a little bit surprised by the comments that I heard, and it had to do, and mostly from the Navy, accusing the Marine Corps of turning their backs on the Navy, where amphibious operations were concerned, okay? And we have been focused in a Afghanistan and Iraq over the course of the last 10 years, I've got it. But I will tell you, we never, sail, never failed to sail a mew. We never failed to source a attack air integration squadron aboard one of the carriers. We've been there. Now, did we do everything we could have done? No, we didn't, okay? And is there room for improvement? Absolutely. Okay, now, with that said, as we shift our focus to the Pacific and we start looking at what, what requirements are out there, first off, as an AMFIB guy, I will tell you I am frustrated, okay? There's a lot of, a lot of interest in the Pacific, and it's on the high end, all right? And we're going to hear about that tomorrow on one of the panels, all right? It's about high-end operations. And when you look at the range of military operations, I live down in the left-hand corner. He lives in the top right-hand corner, okay? Most of what we need to be prepared to do, he's in the most dangerous course of action, I'm in the most likely course of action. All right, when you start putting dollars into programs, you need to think about the amphibious force. Because not only do we do the military application, but it's a lot of humanitarian assistance, disaster relief type activities that other people can't do. And that's what we're going to be called on to act upon more oftentimes than not. Okay, now, with that said, the uh, information requirements for the warfighter. I think we have similar requirements. All right, as a MU commander, my job was to command and control the, the forces that were assigned to me. And I used to tell my, my S6 folks, if I can't do that, I cannot do my job. It's that simple. And a lot of what the six folks did day in and day out was mundane, but if they didn't do their job, I couldn't do my job. And it's all about the command and control piece. The bandwidth issue is going to continue to be a problem. And I will focus most of my comments on shipboard applications because I will tell you, when you go ashore, life is good. I mean, you all have done, the industry has done a great job of setting us up for success once we go ashore. As a MU commander, I had an MSWAN 
the MU uh, service wide area network. And when I went ashore, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And when I went back to the ship, I would beat my head against the wall because we couldn't do what we needed to do. All right, we have competing priorities aboard the ship. And I'm sure it's the same on the CV side of the house as it is the uh, L-class ships. But you've got to have a bounce on your information requirements and the information flow into the ship, whether it's information, you know, voice or data, it's the same thing. It's operations. It is um, the uh, intelligence piece, which there's lots of tension between those two, ops and intel. The supply maintenance piece, because a lot of what we do goes out of the nipper side. And finally, quality of life. Okay, and this is one that I will tell you um, I have a difficult time with. I'm all about quality of life, but I also never forget that when I'm embarked aboard a ship, I'm on board a United States Navy warship, okay? We're not on a cruise, a holiday cruise. We're out there to defend our, our nation and look out for their interests. So the quality of life piece is a challenge, all right? And I will tell you, and I won't tell you what CNO said it, but he retired a few years ago. You know, I, I have spent time going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Navy captain, uh, Commodore, and the ship CO over quality of life issues. Prior CNO talked about internet access is a quality of life issue. I got it. I'm on board a United States Navy warship, and we're all about that. And when it starts to impact operations or intelligence or our ability to do the supply maintenance piece that we need to have ready aircraft, then I have a problem with that. So we need to figure out how to strike a balance, okay? And some of the things we need to do, and we are doing right now, we talked about, I think General Flynn talked about that at lunch, is developing tactics, techniques, and procedures that are different than what we're doing today so we, we can make more effective and efficient use of, of the uh, systems we have in place. All right, uh, that's one piece. We need to, for those of you that uh, get the uh, CNA quarterly um, report, the one that came out in December talked about the uh, global broadcast system, the GBS, and made some recommendations on how we can do a better job of, of using that particular system that's currently on board our ships, all right? We need to be looking at that. Um, some of the other things that, that I'm, I would ask the Navy to do, you know, we have a great LFOC, Landing Force Operations Center. I don't know how many people have had an opportunity to go board an L-class ship, but we have a really good system in place. And when I walk next door into Flag Plot and see what my, my Navy counterpart, the Commodore, has, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's as if I went back in time 20 years. Now, I haven't been on the ship in the last two years, and I unfortunately didn't get a chance to go down to 32nd Street to go on board one of the AVFIBs to check it out to see if anything had changed in the last couple of years, but it was very disappointing because the command and control piece, the Commodore, I think, is at a disadvantage because he or she doesn't have the tools necessary to do, a, you know, a, to make it easier for them to do their job. And, and we talked about that at lunch. You heard General Flynn talk about um, information denial. All right, and there's no doubt that we're going to be blind from time to time when we're at sea. But obviously, when you get to be an 06 in your respective service, or 05 or whatever, you're going to minus information flow that's coming through a bandwidth pipe, you're gonna to start to recognize patterns. And you should be able to make intelligent decisions based on your past experience and got it. But the challenge is gonna be for us, and, in, um, and I'm sure it would be the same with you, but when we go to disaggregate operations, I need to be able to do the command and control piece. You push the commander's intent out, the ships go away, and if for some reason you go, you know, you go lost communication with them, you're gonna expect those folks to be able to act uh, appropriately and make sound decisions. Um, but we need to, uh, what we need to do, what I'm gonna ask the Navy to do, or maybe we're already doing it, but I, I don't think we are, but every time the Marine Corps invests a bunch of money into the Landing Force Operations Center. We get this thing, it's set up nice, we put additional antennas on the ship, and what happens? It goes in the yard. And when it goes in the yard, if it's not part of that ship configuration, it comes off. And then we have to pay to reinstall those antennas. It doesn't make a lot of sense. We need to come up with a system that will allow us to do modifications, and then they get recorded somehow. So when it goes into the yard, when the ship comes out, the next MU commander falls in on that LFOC, we're not reinventing the wheel. Okay, and I've got uh, two more things, and I think I'm gonna be ready to turn it over to you. The, um, the acquisition process, okay? We have got to do a better job with the acquisition process. We've gotta streamline it. I know Ash Carter's working on that, I got it. We need to do a better job. Commercial off-the-shelf technology is a big deal, and I think we're doing a pretty good job of taking COTS and employing that aboard ashore, okay? The, ship, the shipboard application has got some unique challenges. The uh, electromagnetic interference and all, I got it. The shore-based piece, 
is pretty simple. But the challenge is, how do we apply COTS aboard ship in a timely fashion? This industry here, I mean, I can't think of a better example. When you field something, by the time it gets to us, it's obsolete. By the time it actually gets aboard the ship, it's obsolete. Technology is advancing so quickly, we've got to figure out a way to do, you know, spiral development, and it's, you know, it's a software. You give us hardware, we just keep doing software patches, and things get better and better and better, and our ability to communicate uh, becomes better. And, and then the last thing, and I know there's going to be a panel later this afternoon, and we talked about it, uh, Admiral, and I'm going to touch on it briefly, the cyber piece, cyber warfare. Right? The, the security piece of our communications is obviously very important because we want to make sure that any information that is coming aboard the ship is accurate so that when we do make those, those decisions, we're not getting some disinformation that's, that's heading us astray. So with that, I'm going to stop, uh, and I look forward to your, your questions in, during the Q&A. Over to you. Thanks, Greg. Pete? Thank you, Admiral. Uh, first of all, good afternoon to all of you. How are you all doing today? <laughs> first panel after lunch. Stay awake, please. Hey, first I wanted to say a hi to an uh, old shipmate and uh, one of our Sea Daddy mentors from before, Vice Admiral Pete Daly, who has been watching my career for uh, many years. In fact, uh, I took over the keys on Nimitz, and I, uh, I know that a lot of great flag officers have had the keys to this great strike group, the Nimitz strike group, and one of them is Vice Admiral Pete Daly. So thank you for giving me this opportunity, sir, to address this very august group. Um, let me first give you a running fix, and you know, we're, we're talking about information, but let me give you a running fix on the fleet. And if you think about it, um, Carl Vinson got underway uh, right after she had turned around six months. Abe Lincoln from Pac Northwest held, uh, went up to and rounded the Strait of Hormuz. I think you saw it if you're around here in the San Diego newspaper. Uh, swapped to John C. Stennis. All three of those carriers are from the West Coast. I mean, if you think about it, um, your fleet, our fleet, the men and women that man those ships and strike groups and those SAGs and submarines and squadrons um, are very motivated. They're very professional. And, and I, can, I can speak from just observing my team. Uh, verily, uh, very enthusiastic and very forward-leaning, especially the millennia generation. I mean, you just get out of the way. So it's very exciting to to work with these professionals out there. And it's folks like uh, the panel members and, and, to be honest, you. Got to make sure we pace and, and we take care of this most valuable resource that we have in our Navy, the best Navy in the world. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to try to do something that is not uh, common to me. I'm going to be very succinct. This is going to be very hard, but I'm just going to give you three points up front. My three points up front hopefully will... Uh, promote a lot of questions from you because, you know, I, I can't read your mind, but you really are where the rubber meets the road in terms of how we get things out to the warfighter. And the, and the three, the way I break it is a comment. The first one is something big picture writ large on process. The second thing is, is on how we prepare strike groups, ships to get ready to deploy. And then the third is, is a system that we use when we are deployed. So the first thing that I want to touch on is, is um, we talk about the acquisition process in many ways. Everybody in here has probably lived through the acquisition process to get to a program of record. And that could be a long sojourn, as many of you can attest. But industry, I think, has been so responsive to the warfighter in the 21st century, it's almost like an Office Depot commercial. You know, yeah, we got that. What do you all need? You know, four-star pipes up and go, I need something that can do this and change it to this. Yeah, we got that. And so how has, how has the military and folks like Spa Wars adopted to, adapted to that? Well, we've got things such as interim authorization to test, interim authorization to, to uh, operate. All of those measures uh, are good for the warfighter right in the beginning. And, and you know, normally... Uh, the commander's out of sea going, I like that system. Hey, this is great. It works. No kidding, it works. Because industry says, what do you need? And we got it, right? But, but here's the problem. The problem in that is these interim systems sometimes never survive that long sojourn to be a program of record. But the fact of the matter is, if I round the Strait of Hormuz, I expect every system there to work if I have to go to war. 
If I have to go in combat, I shouldn't be saying, hey, sir, we've got whatever widget has gone down. I need to have the transparency of those systems that are on board our ships to have three fundamental things. Number one, that you have technical support, okay? Technical support, people coming out there and having the money to pay technicians to go out there or do remote uh, casualty re uh, uh, repairs. Number two, the part support, and then the formalized training. And all of those three are satisfied if you had a program of record. But what I see in the fleet, and we have you know, some systems that are in a caretaker status, is that something called uh, TVS, for example, and I'll just throw that out to you. You know, TVS is fundamental in a switchboard for communications. Everything goes in there and gets modulated and it gets panned out. Uh, it's like a SIG Pro on, on an Aegis. If it goes down, it, uh, you really cripple your communications on a ship or a strike group. Uh, is it a program of record? No, because they thought something else was going to replace it, but that's a long time in coming. So what I'm saying to the industry, to you all, we need to partner with the Navy to help close the gap between coming up with interim systems that work, close the gap and saying, what things can we do to get these things so that it will be transparent to the warfighter? It doesn't have to get to the program of record, but the transparency are those three criteria I gave you. So that's big picture. The other part that I want to transition to is training. You know, my uh, strike group is currently going through a uh, fleet readiness response team, uh, training plan, the FRTP, and we are working up through our group sale in, uh, in May. But the bottom line is there are a lot of systems being installed in my ships. I'm going to have four uh, small boys along with the, the carrier who's had an incredible amount of upgrades during DPIA. And what's critical about those upgrades are, you know, we have learned in the fleet that we do things called Digisit, where you go in there and actually verify and do the training right before COM2X. But guess what? That's right before COM2X. COM2X is when we get underway and we do the tactics and we do the integrated maneuvers after everybody's certified to come in. It's too late to say, hey, is that thing integrated? So the fleet and concert with industry has come up with this thing called ISOVOT, integrated SOVOT. What does that have to do with you? It has a lot to do with you. When you install your systems on these ships and on our carriers, it needs to be timed well so that it's well ahead of the power curve before we even roll into a group sale. Before I go into group sale. Because I need to make sure that those systems, that when you test it individually, can talk to all the other systems. And then I need some time to kind of air out the Menahunis, you know, all the different things that happen to a system when it's first installed. I need that time to train my, my, my warriors on that strike group to be able to integrate that. So in ISOVOT, for the, for the Navy side, for the SPAWAR side, we need to institutionalize something like that, Jerry, because uh, Nimitz had it for the first time. I think December was, we were the first one as a pilot program, and it worked very well. But I'm telling you for industry, the so what for industry is that you got to make sure you, you're, you time the installation and verification of your respective systems in consonance with what that strike group is doing and fold it under this ISOVOT that we have. So it'll make sense and we are not fixing things when we actually should be training how to fight during COM2X. And then the final thing that I would throw out to you is once the carrier deploys you will find that we do nothing out there USN only. Not at all. In the 5th Fleet, 7th Fleet operations where I've operated on a lot, it's always under a coalition construct. So you look at the communication of, of interest, these enclaves that we use to work with our coalition partners, with our allies in armistice, for example, Korea, it's called Centrix. But Centrix has many different enclaves. For example, you know, uh, for example, I just came from Korea. There is a Centrix K, there's a Centrix J. Do you think the two talk? I mean, it's in the Northeast Asia. I'll answer that question. They don't. Now, I understand that Centrix, for example, has all these different barriers, right? You have policy barriers for, for things like that. You have cultural barriers. Cultural read Japan and Korea. Somehow there's a little bit of friction there. I can't figure it out. But seriously, though, 
they don't trust each other, so they're not going to share information. What I am asking industry is this. There are certain things that we can do better to speed up the data sharing, authentication, the, dig the digital mapping of information so that if one user in the coalition says, hey, we need this, I need this from the guys from Fifth Fleet, industry finds a way to close the gap so that we can better speed up sharing in enclaves. Because for us, you know, time is life for us as a warfighter. You know, what's uh, Arlie Burke said, what's the difference between a good ship and a great ship? The answer was six seconds. So th the point to me, to you, is that any way that you can help us in this enclave of information, there's so much information, and how do we break down some of these protocols uh, would be extremely helpful to the warfighter out there. And with that, I'll stop. I hope I was succinct, and I'll pass it on to Admiral Burroughs. Thank, Thank you. you. Jerry? Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, pre I appreciate your time and opportunity. Um, as a PEO, I am responsible for responding to the requirements and the resource sponsor requirements transmitted to us via the resource sponsor to develop and field what Pete referred to as program of record systems, which covers the whole, you know, development, fielding, support in conjunction with our Space War partners. Uh, the whole yard, the whole nine yards with, with logistics and all. Um, but I can only respond to requirements that are transmitted to me. For example, even if I have a really smart idea to deliver something that's in excess of what the requirements that I have are, and, and even if the fleet has a demand for it tomorrow, I can't do it unless I go back and get permission through a configuration change board to do that. So in some extent, to an extent, what I feel um, is I'm a little bit hamstrung by the requirements is what I'm trying to say. But that's not always a bad thing and, and oftentimes we need that discipline. But we do look for ways and, I, and one of my major strategic goals in the PEO is, is to look for ways working within the DOD 5000 to deliver capability faster with, you know, much more responsive to what the warfighter needs. And there's, there's a realization, especially in the area of IT, that we have to do that. And there's several initiatives um, that are being looked at to help us do that. And so I, we do look for how we can do that and, and we do want to be more responsive. But again, at the end of the day, we've got to respond to the requirements. Um, and we, we publish what's called a C4I roadmap and a master plan that looks out across the next, at least across the FIDA, at where our systems are going and where they're migrating to. So every year I task my S&T lead to take a look at that roadmap, look at where we are with technology to fulfill the requirements of that roadmap, because everything in that roadmap I have requirements for, so the umbrella I, I'm covered there. And so every year we do look at that and we come up with, with gaps that we need to meet to fill those requirements. Now, so in some cases, I can meet the requirements today, but I need to do it better, more efficiently, uh, and frankly, cheaper than, than what we're doing it today. So that's what we put out to industry saying, hey, here, here's our S&T gaps, and here's what we'd like for you to work on. And I certainly can provide that to you. I'll go through a few of them today but it's a pretty extensive list, and so I'll just rattle off a few. But before I do, I'll, I'd like to say a few words about uh, how we do that. I mean, and I think in general, we, we tend to try to make things too complicated um, and overestimate how much, how elegant a solution has to be and, and how much time we have to take to do it. So uh, what I want to tell you is simpler, faster, is always better. Um, and there, there was a mention of COTS technology. Uh, it's my job to take COTS technology and to provide the support, provide the, the training infrastructure, et cetera, to make that fully supportable. And we have to do that. And we have to do that whenever we can. If we're not going to use a COTS piece of equipment, then I can promise you that the government is going to expect to have full data rights for whatever you're developing. 
the days of buying systems without data rights, which limit our competition today and in the future, are largely over. I, I, I cannot get an acquisition strategy through that, that employed that type of proprietary um, data rights. Just not going to happen. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, so again, th those are some of the constraints we work within. And you know, there was, you know, the acquisition process gets a bad name, gets a bad rap, deservedly so in most cases. You know, the elegant and efficient JSITS process is not one that many uh, organizations want to emulate. But that's that's what we have to deal with. But we have to figure out how to do it faster and and more efficiently. And, and that's always hard. But you know, there's a Everyone realizes it's not fast or efficient enough, but how do you change it to make it so, you know, without throwing out the baby with the bathwater? That's, that's the thing that we grapple with. But until that time, we're going to continue to work it as hard as we can to make sure that we're delivering as quickly as the system will allow. And, and frankly, if there are shortcuts we can take, that I have the, the authority to do that, then I will analyze the risk. And if it's a reasonable risk, then I'm willing to take it. So. So on the S&T roadmap, I'll just give you the major areas that we cover, and, and I'll throw out a couple of examples of things that might be covered under there, but certainly we could discuss it in more detail, and, 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 and that is available. In the area of communications, obviously, it's spoken to today, we need increased throughput, uh, dynamic spectrum management to tactical users. Absolutely key. The demand for bandwidth only goes up. It never goes down. So we, we have that. Improved two-way communication systems and mobile platforms platform coverage through steerable multiple antenna beams, multi-band antenna systems, just a couple of examples. In the area of networks, uh, we need to support all domain coverage uh, using sensor networks that can continuously collect battle space information, uh, using self-forming, self-healing, dynamic ad hoc networks, and, for, and using standard IP protocols. Another example would be network management technologies to support and maintain enterprise networking in degraded environments, which we frequently have to operate in. Uh, in the areas of common computing environment, we need to support the infra infrastructure consolidation and reduction in size, weight, and power. Um, and that's especially important for modernization because as we modernize ships, there's a demand for more capability but the size, weight, and power is fixed. So we have to be able to fit in that envelope, and we have to be smart about how we do that. Uh, another example would be provide technologies for network sensing, monitoring, and automated management and installation. Uh, in the area of application services, support battle space awareness and command and control services in operation in tactical environments. Uh, provide ISR, IO, METOC, MDA, cyber, and C2 applications within broad-based architecture and uh, again, limited environments. Uh, Cross-cutting services, robust modular scalable, self-adapting computer network defense capabilities, and distributed IA capabilities across consolidated networks. Uh, the IA area, I don't need to tell anyone in here, it, it's, it's, it's floating in the, in the number of requirements that, that you have to keep up with to, to maintain networks safe and secure. So we need better technology and, and better ways to do that. A lot more automation than we have today uh, because if we don't get our arms around that, we, we will never be able to afford to keep our network secure. Uh, common services provide information services that support com computing systems management and forecasting, forecasting, data management, visualization, and secure voice and video. Uh, technologies that enable secure voice interoperability that is independent of the end devices and always based on open standards. So those are some of the areas that, that we see a need. Um, and I would encourage you to learn more about that. And, and certainly, I, I make it a priority to get out <coughs> and visit industry to learn what you're doing uh, and, and how we can help you and, and how you can help us. So I will do everything I can to keep that dialogue going. And most importantly, I, I want to figure out how to make it as easy as I can uh, for industry to work with the government. Um, the FAR guidelines are the FAR guidelines. We can never get around that, but certainly look for ways to, to streamline whenever we can. So 
Uh, again, I appreciate your time and uh, look forward to the dialogue to follow. Thanks. Okay, before I let you ask questions, I'm going to do something. I, I'm going to violate a moderator's uh, standing orders. And uh, how many of you have been to Korea? How many have been to Korea in the last year? Well, the Admiral has. And I'm going to ask Pete, just, just for the heck of it, I asked him, I said, can you give us about a five minute, I mean, I've read a lot about Korea in the last couple of months, so have you. Give us about a five minute quick current events update on Korea. So I know that's not related to the panel, but I think it may be something that, uh, that you will value. Pete? Thank you, sir. And I just got this note beforehand, so I'll, I'll kind of, five minutes is kind of tough, but here we, here we go. Uh, Kim Jong-un, who is Kim Jong-un? And to be honest, uh, General Sharp and the USFK leadership over in Korea was asking the same question, including the Republic of Korea Army. So who is Kim Jong-un? It's 28-year-old, third son of Kim Jong-il, and then all of a sudden, last July or last summer, became obvious that it's gonna be the third son that he's gonna proffer up as, as the heir apparent. It concerned a lot of uh, folks in the peninsula. Concerned him because, not because we didn't know about Kim Jong-un, it's because there was a lot of concern that there, the ensuing instability that would occur when Kim Jong-il dies, and Kim Jong-un had not had enough time like Kim Jong-il did. If you think about Kim, Kim Il-sung, the great leader, and then the dear leader is Kim Jong-il, he had 15 years to establish a power base under his dad. Kim Jong-un did not have that. So Korea was very concerned about the implosion of a civil war. And to be honest, the South Koreans were licking their chops because they go, they really want to unify there, by the way. They want to unify. They don't want to unify in a, in a violent way, but they just want to unify their peninsula. Because if you look at Korea, Korea you have to look as a peninsula for over 5,000 years, they were one peninsula. They were the Shila dynasty, the Chosun dynasty, the Korea dynasty. So don't ask whether it's north or south. Just say Koreans. Just like we say Americans, Koreans. So there is a big drive there to reunify the peninsula. And South Korea will do it either by chance, re-civil war with Kim Jong-un, or if an opportunity develops where Kim Jong-un opens up, they are willing to do anything and everything. Okay, let me pause on that, because you can read the rest from all State Department reports on Kim Jong-un. Let me tell you about the organization out there, because that's a black hole. Korea is ground-centric, okay? It's really testosterone on army. Lots of hua, lots of hua. Okay, 28,000 some. There's this thing called tour normalization. We're trying to normalize the tours over there. Instead of a one-year tour, soldiers and their families can be there for three years. That has been in the works for a long time. And that OPCON transfer where now the ROC Army, remember, ROC, the Army's big. ROC Army's gonna supposedly take over in the year 2015. When I say take over, it means the Korean military is going to be the supported commander. The U.S. Since, since 60 years ago, we have always been the lead dogs over there in terms of what happens in the military and the defense of Korea. But now the military and, and the South Koreans are so competent, they're very, very good, very proficient, they're very big, they're very modern. They have three Aegis ships, KDX-3 ships, that's how modern they are. They have the money, which means they have very, very good weaponry. And the U.S., we have decided to say, hey, you take the lead in 2015 and we will support you. So that's going to happen downstream, but you should know that the sub-unified commander of four-star USFK, we are in an armistice right now in Korea. So if it goes into a war situation like we had almost with the Chonan and Yongpyeongdo last year, uh, then he shifts his hat from a sub-unified commander, that general, into the Combined Forces Commander, CFC, and he reports then directly to the Secretary of Defense. I share that with you because, really, the C2 lines out there, unless you live it and, and you just don't understand it, you need to know when you're out there. And C2 is so important on who calls the shots. Like, I'm Naval Forces Korea. I, don't have any, I didn't have any ships out in Korea. It was really 7th Fleet who was the operational commander out there. So you should know that. You should know that 7th Fleet is the guy that would have to respond to the Combined Forces Commander to support them in time of war. 
And, and everybody else is the same way. So the, the C2 lines, that's CNFK, I supported 7th Fleet, I supported PAC Fleet, I supported USFK, and I was a deputy Navy component commander for the ROC Navy. So we have many hats out there, and if you're ever interested, there's so many things in regards to C2 and so many challenges out there in Korea in regards to C2, and this isn't over yet. So this chapter isn't over yet. And the final thing I'll say is 2012 is going to be a very interesting year in Korea. Why? Because it's supposed to be the declaration of the grand and prosperous nation, and it happens to be 2012. And 2012 may be, may be un unstable, depending on what happens to Kim Jong-un. So, you know, stay tuned. It's not going to happen overnight, but stay tuned to Korea because it will come back in the CNN uh, headline news again. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Pete. I, I think it, that we need to do that every once in a while. I'm going to ask uh, Greg to bring us back to C4I. Okay. What I, I would like to add one thing that, uh, to what Jerry talked about, and this, this goes out to industry. We talked about the complexity of the systems you're designing. All right, he, he urges you to keep it simple. They also need to be reliable and easily maintainable whether that's a board ship or a shore, that is key, all right? It is all about reliability and maintainability. So keep it simple and reliable and maintainable. All right, thanks. Okay, now you can line up. I see you, Pete. You can start us off. Thank you. In a few days, uh, we're going to be doing the Bold Alligator uh, series uh, on the East Coast, big exercise. And uh, it's hugely strategically important. I think it represents a lot to get the Marines back and to have the Navy acknowledge their commitments to Marines at sea, med level operations, and the support for that. Uh, I was going to ask Admiral Burroughs, are we looking at the integration on the Marines? Do we have a special effort at the Spay War level to learn from this event? It seems to me it's the tale of two different investment streams. The Marines, lots of OCO, tons of fiber, better systems, and frankly, a Navy that made the amphib connectivity uh, a lower priority without the Marines, frankly, being there uh, to be a major advocate. So are we, are we looking at this as a learning exercise? And finally, a comment about you know, the response to requirements. I think especially on this legacy thing, it would be good, I ask you to comment on this, it would be good to have Spay War talk to the customers and raise this back to D.C. If you say things like TVS in the Pentagon, they just tilt. They don't want to hear about the legacy piece, and you might be the best guy to roll it up for them and say, fix these three or five things. So a lot there, but I'd ask you to comment. Okay, on the bold alligator, um, I, I think, um, well, first, there's a lot of activity going on on those ships right now to prepare them for bold alligator, alligator from a C4I perspective. but. You, as you point out, the most important thing is what can we learn? Um, and uh, we are working with uh, our counterparts at Fleet Forces Command who are running that exercise to, to help them um, help us really pull out where's the shortfalls, uh, how can we help you with the resource sponsor to identify those shortfalls and get them through the, through the requirements process. So that is very important. I mean, that's one of the if we don't get that out of the exercise, then we probably wasted our time. So, yes, sir, we will absolutely be doing that. On the requirements front, um, I, I hate, I, it's a difficult question to answer, but those, all those issues are very well known. They, they, and as we have struggled to support systems like TVS, we have put in POM issue papers to the resource sponsor saying, hey, this really needs to be supported. In the rack and stack process, it hasn't always made it to the, above the cut line and, and therefore not funded. Um, I, I am optimistic because in the last couple of years, and I think partly thanks to you and certainly Admiral Harvey, some of these issues have gotten raised up to a much higher level. And the fleet, when the fleet comes in and says, this is a real problem for us, OpNav is forced to listen, and they, and they will listen. But that hasn't happened as well in the past as it, as it needs to. So to sum it up, we really want to fix those issues, and we really need to help from the fleet to make sure that those requirements are understood at the OpNav level. And I think, again, that has been much better in the last year or two, and I thank you for 
helping out in that regard. It, you know, sir, I, I think that's an important point, though. And I, obviously, I don't sit in the Navy Marine Corps talks, but it'd be interesting to see at what level that was getting bumped up to. Because with the declining dollar, and you just heard General Flynn talk about it, we're not going to be able to afford everything. All right, and it really makes a lot of sense. It goes back to that Navy Marine Corps team. If we can figure out a system that can go aboard ship and they can phase ashore, and it's a seamless transition, that's the, obviously the way we need to go. You know, it, and uh, one of the other things with this declining dollar, and this goes back to requirements, so, and, and I, I tell you, you know, we have got so many systems out there that are not programs or record, and a lot of them need to go. Plain and simple, they need to be killed. All right, the problem is every time we try and kill one of those programs, we have people that have friends in high places and they want to go in there and pay them a visit. And I hate to say it, you know, unfortunately there are times where we're going to have to take some programs down. Those that are, that are doing well, we're going to survive. Those that aren't doing so well or no longer needed, need to go away. Yes, sir. There's been a very good discussion on, on COTS products as, as part of this. For the last few years, there's also been a lot of discussion about open source. And is open source free, or is it like the free kitten that you get and you get to take home? Uh, I think a lot of commands have found that the O&M tail and things like training that, that were discussed have made open source not as inexpensive as thought. And the COTS may be the best answer. Really like to get the thoughts from the three panel members on the question of open source versus COTS. I assume you're talking about open source software? Okay. Um, okay. Um, open source software, I think, is a good thing when it's, when it's done properly. Um, obviously, I can't throw a piece of software out that has no support at all behind it. And, and I don't have the, the wherewithal to support it internally and with, and with Spay War. Uh, that, that's why, you know, that's. That's why Red Hat has been successful. They've been able to take open, open source software and provide that backroom support for it and some assurance that it's been tested and, and, and run through some, you know, some rigor before it's fielded. So I think a model like that works pretty well. Um, and, and, there's, and it's something that we can, we can definitely take advantage of, and we do take advantage of it. But, if I just if I'm going to use just a, a straight open source software, then I'm probably going to have to pay for that backroom support on my own. But there's there's times when that makes sense, and there's times when it doesn't. I would suggest you ask the same question in the security panel. You you might find uh, a different answer there, but I, I think you need to do that. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, in my thoughts about supporting the warfighter. I was thinking that um, a current problem that we have been facing for the last couple of years, not only on the DLA side, but on the COT side, is parts obsolescence and the uh, infiltration of counterfeit parts into both COTS and DLA systems. I don't think that our warfighters, either on a ship or on the ground, should be the ones that have to suffer the consequences when someone back ashore has not done their job to ensure that legitimate quality parts make their way to the front lines. I'd like to know from the three of you if you know what is being done within your different branches to ensure that there's a proactive management taking place of these obsolete parts and identification of counterfeit parts. And um, let's see, also, oh, I was going to mention that uh, Senators McCain and Levine have both been raising the priority of what, uh, the, how large this problem has grown to be, again, with NDLA and with the COTS community. Now this is not software, it's based on component parts that launch missiles, that keep helicopters in the air, that keep uh, every platform going across all of your different branches. So can any of you give me any feedback as to how you are planning to address this issue. And I have very passionate concerns about this as I have two sons serving forward, both in the Marine Corps and in the Army. So I want to make sure their systems are working. I'd like to know from you. Yeah, I, I don't know if we're the right panel. Maybe, <laughs> Jerry. Well, you're really asking two different, two different questions there. On the obsolescence issue, um, 
it is our job as as PEO and SPAWAR to to make sure that we are tracking the reliability and and the sustainability of those systems, and we do that. We do run into areas where obsolescence is a big problem, and and we have to look far enough ahead so that we can find an adequate solution that's going to meet that. In general, the answer is make your modernization programs work faster, which is what we really need to do so that you don't run into that, but it's going to be inevitable to, to a degree. I can tell you that, that we do actively look at that and, and try to avoid it uh, whenever possible. And at the end of the day, we're never going to leave someone stranded and say, sorry, it's obsolete, it's not going to work. We're never going to do that. We're going to find a solution to make it work. Now, the other supply chain issue is a much more complicated one. Um, and that is an issue that every, every branch is facing, every, and, and it's not specific to Navy, obviously. Um, I can only tell you um, there are no formal requirements today on how you handle that. I think DOD is working on what the, how they want us to go about that. So what do we do in the meantime? Um, first of all, we, I have very active dialogue with all of my industry partners on this issue. They understand the criticality of it, and they understand that their reputation gets tarnished as well as ours when a, when a counterfeit part goes out. Uh, and and a, one contract I have now, I, I specify that they buy by name parts from the vendor instead of buying it from a gray source somewhere. And that's generally what happens. It, when these things enter the system, they were bought at some gray source saying they were, you name it, I don't want to call out any vendors here, but that's the biggest thing I can do in, 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 the, mean, in the near term is to specify that they are bought from brand names from a vendor. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. I can talk more after if you'd like. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cole Krumholtz. Um, and I'm getting all the questions here. These guys are here too. Oh, that's everything's all <laughs> this right. Is, this is a very high level question, so I think anyone can answer it. Um, I've, I've uh, spent some time in the military. Um, I was a contractor for a couple years, and then uh, I was, I've been in Silicon Valley for the last few years working on startups. And one of the striking differences that I've noticed between sort of the way that I see things happening in Silicon Valley and some of the d just, you know, in information I've gathered in the few days that I've been here is this notion of transition. Um, as an engineer, I feel like one of the most powerful forces, uh, motivating forces, is to watch somebody use a product that I've built and not be able to get it. That's, it's an out-of-body experience. It makes me want to jump over there, push them aside, fix what I'm doing, and say, okay, try again, please. I feel like um, this notion of transition breaks the connection, that emotional connection between the engineer and uh, the user of the product. Right, sorry, just, I, I need you to ask a question. We've we got three more questions sorry, at no. least. Come on. I just wonder if, uh, if you see that as being a challenge and if there are any ways of trying to create a connection there between engineers. Are, are you really talking about how do we take the user in mind when we're developing a system? Is that? I think it's a, it's a question of a, a more continuous relationship. Um, and I'm just wondering um, if you thoughts on that. I'll, I'll quickly say one thing. I mean, some of our, when, when I talk about how we're working on a rapidly fielding programs, we are, that, that's really what we're doing. We're, we're going into the lab. We have an initial set of requirements that the user is giving us directly. We're working on the system. We're developing the capability. We're giving it back to the user. Okay, go try this. He says, yep, I like it. It's about like to do X, Y, and Z. We go back and work on it a while. We try to get X, Y, and Z, and we give it back to them and say, okay, now try this. That iterative process is key to more rapidly fielding effective capability, and we're trying to use that whenever we can. And, and may I add that, you know, Spower has a, a very good way of, of validating before systems starts to get introduced to the fleet to include having sailors, you know, go over there and operate and say, hey, does this work, to match all the power requirements, all of that. But let me transition to, like, once it gets on the deck plate. I mean, I, I talked to you about the timing of industry and when they put these things. And, you know, they ha you, you understand the term TCDs, right, techno cutoff dates and when you can install things and all that. But it's more tied to the familiarity of that operator. You know, you, you're wedded to that, to that widget, whatever it is, because you made it. You understand it. It almost talks to you like 4S or whatever. 
But for a sailor, the sailor just needs to see that cop, and I just need to see that maritime picture. We just want to get this done. So you, you got to find the time on the fleet, not only to integrate it so it's talking to other systems, but you get the sailors the right, proper, formal training, and then the follow-up for those sailors' relief. Because, by the way, one-third of a crew gets turned over every year. So these new systems that get put on, the frustration that you have on the ship, you know, you won't have this bonding unless you get the proper formal training and the ample time prior to us putting a lot of pressure on that sailor. Here, here's an example. If you don't train that sailor right, and then we go into a, a combat training mode like Comp2X or JTFX, that piece of equipment, as shiny and beautiful it is, it's probably going to sit in the corner, and those sailors are going to use the systems that they know works and they are trained to and they're comfortable with because they just want to shoot that incoming vampire and they just want to take out this thing. So look at it from the perspective of you already knowing what the system is, but you need to ask SPAWARS, you need to ask the process do we have the right formal training? And is there sustained formal training, technical support, and parts to support that great widget that you just gave us? Does that make sense? All right. I think we got time for one more question. I, uh, this is for General Sturdivant, and uh, anybody else who wants to take it on. Uh, I was fascinated with your uh, discussion about LFOC and the flag plot and the differences therein. and. Uh, then your next comment on the budget infighting inside the Pentagon. I heard the, uh, the uh, discussion yesterday about fired or uh, <clears throat> hang together or hang separately. Fifteen years ago, I heard the exact same discussion between uh, then Lieutenant General Zinni talking about I fly or I thrive or I die with Herb Brown in the Third Fleet. And I suspect that if we heard uh, Lieutenant General Geiger and Vice Admiral Halsey talking, it would be much the same. So it looks good out here. It doesn't look good, and the Pentagon never has. N85 was supposed to fix that. Is it as bad as it sounds? Does the Department of the Navy mitigate the budget infighting, or are we really trying to uh, eat each other's lunch on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, in there? Okay. Okay. The, uh let me remind you, my current billet is the assistant wing commander up here at 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. So uh, I left the building. I ran out of the building in uh, late June, and I'm happy to be out here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've, I've done numerous tours in the Pentagon, and I was talking to Pete. We were weird. He was kind of poking me. But we do a great job. You know, as, as you build the budget, we, the Marine Corps fight with the Navy over the budget. Then we team together, and we go fight OSD. And then we team with OSD, and we go fight the Hill. And then the Navy pays for it. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and I tell you. What's up with that? And we're all about that. I am all about picking Admiral Blake's pocket and the CNO. But, but really, though, if you, you know, we spend so much time. We fight like brothers. You know, all we want to do is beat the hell out of each other. It makes a whole lot more sense if we would team together. So how do you do that? It's got to take place. And I think it is, I think we're starting to gather some momentum in the Pentagon at the, at the you know, vice CNO, ACMAC, CNO, uh, commandant level, where we, there's an appreciation for the fact that we could do a whole lot better. We'll get further along if we do it together. Because I, I go right back to focus on the Pacific, right, Dr. Cole? We focus on the Pacific, the ready force, the force that's going to be forward, that's going to be able to sit off the coast of any country in the world and not have to ask permission to come ashore, like we heard yesterday, is going to be the United States Navy. They're going to be embarked aboard carriers, and they're going to be on the L-class ships. So, you know, when you think air sea battle, I got it. The amphib piece is a little portion of that, but the Navy and Marine Corps team, I'm with you. It's never been stronger. We have a great relationship out here. Admiral Beeman and Lieutenant General Waldhauser get along great. By the time you, you know, the further east you go, the more difficult it gets. And it's just, a, it's a fact of life. You know, we're in a knife fight for dollars, so may the best man win. No, we sure. are, and, and, and may I add, General, that the, the strategy that was just recently put out by Admiral Greener and stuff talks about the naval force and talks about the expeditionary uniqueness about the Navy Marine Corps team. And, and I will tell you, if we want to stay relevant, I mean, this is to the, the, the blue and green brothers that are out here. If we want to stay relevant in the 21st century, we must hang our hats in the core competencies that only the naval force can provide to support our national policies. We got to hang our hat on that. You know, in the last 10 years, 
Our brothers have been leaving us off on the ships and going in in Afghanistan and Iraq to do our country's bidding. I'm telling you for the 21st century with the Pacific being the focus and the Pacific being maritime dominant, you know, more water than it is land, I'm telling you we need to go back to our core. And the Naval Force Corps is expeditionary. And the Naval Force is, it can sustain itself, it is flexible, it is responsive, it is the first force on station, you know? You're not gonna get the Air Force there and you're not gonna get the Garrison Hua guys there first. It's gonna be the Naval Force. And I tell you, no other service does that. Well, maybe the Coast Guard, but you know the Coast Guard is not uh, the Department of Defense. So my, my, my point to you is, if you're looking, if you're looking for the future, you know, the Navy Marine Corps team, yeah, we are brothers, yeah, we argue sometimes in the bedroom, but when we go out in the living room, I'll tell you what, we got the best poo-poos out there than any other service has when you're serving it out, right? right. That put it in the right context? I, I, right. Uh, it, it's time for us to go, but I, I, were you all surprised? I, I was surprised by the panel. Uh, I, would have, I would have put better than even money that, uh, that Greg and Pete would have beat Dury up, that, that COTS <laughs> was the issue, you've got to have to do it, and you're going to have to do it now. And what I heard is basically what General Flynn said at lunch, that we have legacy systems, that's the world we're in, and we need to find ways to do better with the legacy systems because of what they bring. Now, I was totally surprised by that. My generation said absolutely the opposite. It said, hey, the acquisition system is broken and, and we have to fix it, we have to fix it now by cot. So I was surprised. Now, maybe that's my, maybe my summation is incorrect, but I was surprised by that. And uh, so I, as always, I learned a very great deal. I think it's an absolutely marvelous panel and thank each and every one of you.